Okay, we're live, yes? Yes, we're live. Yeah, uh, th th thank you very much uh, to everybody who's joining us uh, this morning, afternoon or evening. Where we... It's important for us uh, to firstly, to put this session into context. Um, the context is that the World Health Assembly in 2019 adopted resolution to address patient safety in our health systems. And in doing so, they expressed a need for a global patient safety action plan, uh, which all member states could uh, incorporate. And WHO Sierra, WHO AMRO, WHO Africa, WHO PAHO, um, WIPRO have all agreed to this plan. And this uh, plan uh, enhances and uh, supports uh, the third global challenge that uh, was disrupted by the pandemic and which was medication safety. And medication safety is very important for us because it's the central pillar of the global patient safety plan. Today, I've got very distinguished uh, speakers here. I would ask each speaker to introduce themselves because it's very important that you hear from them what they do and uh, a brief idea as to what brings them here is all most importantly and their commitment. Thank you very much. Um, could I have the first speaker, please uh, introduce yourself and um, tell us what brings you here and your your passion for this. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, my name is Devashish Patacharya. Uh, I head up medical safety in the Global Safety Assurance and Racket. Now, what brings me here today is what I actually see is there are a lot of deaths from medication errors all over the world. And uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of it. I mean, deaths happen in disease, that is fine. But this death due to safety of the medicines, it is very preventable and very correctable. And we must make a lot of effort in trying to rectify this so that, you know, these are deaths by unforced errors. And if these unforced errors can be reversed, I think the world will be a much better place to live in. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. Could I have the next speaker, please, now to um, um, tell us who they are and why they're here, more importantly? Uh, hello? No, Dr. Nagaba? Yes, sir. You, you're next. Hello. Please tell us why you're here, what makes you passionate about Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm here. I'm here to focus attention on the product quality and the safety. These are the two important interconnected issues. And um, we are the pharmacy background and also the uh, member of International Alliance of Patient Organizations. We must strive for better uh, uh, product quality and also the patient safety, uh, I'm going to talk on this. And also Thank I would you. like to talk about Indian uh, as a, a hub of uh, pharmaceutical activities, where the, the global export uh, is very much uh, active in, from this country to other countries. So I would like to focus on these issues. Uh, th th thank you very much. Uh, could I have the next speaker as well? Uh, we had a very good uh, chat on that. Um, Mr. Manoj. Uh, Hello, everyone. I'm Manoj Lekrajani. I am a pharmacist by profession, and it has been my passion to ensure and see that community ph pharmacy comes to the patient's doorstep. Uh, what we have been doing over the last, past three decades is to ensure that every product, that every medication that we service is maintained in the temperature control as required by the labeling conditions. And also we, we ensure that the adherence to doctor's prescription is maintained while servicing the patient. The goal uh, thank, thank is- you. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, carry on, sorry. Okay, now um, could I have my next uh, speaker please uh, to introduce themselves and it's- um, um, Mr. Mata and I had quite a discussion on uh, 
over kind of common grounds and that. So Mr. Matek, could I have a brief introduction from you and uh, what your passion I know is coming to quite clearly when we were having earlier discussions. Mr. Mehta? Yeah, so, I mean, my passion is quite simple. Tomorrow has to be better than yesterday. I, I spend a fair bit of time in the world of quality. Uh, I'm the vice president of CAHO, which is the consortium of accredited healthcare organizations uh, which is now a global organization, started out of India, focusing on quality with accredited healthcare institutions, diagnostic clinics, hospitals, and the like. We currently have around 4,000 members today across the world. We're partners with ISQUA and ASQUA and many other leading organizations for patient safety and stewardship for quality. Uh, I think uh, it's very simple. Tomorrow, better than yesterday, we spend time in a healthcare system that's uh, next year, we'll celebrate our 90th year, which is Dr. Mehta's hospitals. We have spent time in the pharma industry, both uh, as an owner, as well as an advisor when I was in McKinsey and Company uh, out of the US. And uh, why I'm here today is basically to improve and uh, spread the perspective of patient safety, but more importantly, to perhaps learn from the experiences of others on this uh, astute panel. Thank you. Oh. Thank, thank you very much. With that uh, out of the way and knowing where we are each coming from, I would now ask the first speakers, uh, speaker, um, I, Dr. Bhattacharya, to start the uh, session. Dr. Bhattacharya? Yes, please. Can we have the first slide, please, Ankit? Yes, um, uh, right, fine. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So I'm talking about naming, labeling, and packaging and the nuances of naming, naming labeling, and packaging. The so safe use of all medicines actually depends on users reading the labeling and packaging carefully and accurately and being able to assimilate and act on the information presented. The primary purpose of medicines labeling and packaging is a very clear and unambiguous identification of the medicine and the conditions of safe use, which is actually written very clearly and legibly. What are the common factors affecting all users of medicines? It may be summarized under three headings. One is providing information which are vital for the safe use of the medicine. Format, the format might be presented in a very legible manner which is understood by all those people who are involved in the supply and the use of the medicine. And the style, the style of presentation is there's a potential for con confusion between the similarity in drug names and in medicine packages. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so, yeah, so I mean, the, what I was talking about in my introduction was medication errors. Problems with labeling has also been associated with a high percentage of errors. So there is a potential of improving the layout of the medicines to aid, to aid clarity. It should be very clear what medicines, because there are certain names of medicines may be confusing and patients may be exposed and which probably can cause morbidity and mortality. And this can assist healthcare professionals and patients to select the correct medicine. Next slide, please. Yeah. So minimizing errors. How do we minimize errors? Now, there is a critical information that a medicine must contain, which is the name of the medicine, the expression of strength, the route of administration, the pathology, and the warnings. So there is a little call to action here that we should ensure that the critical information necessary to the safe use of the medicine is legible, easily accessible, and the users of medicines are assisted by assimilating this information so that there is no confusion or error. So this has to be very, very clear, whatever the space that you have. Next slide, please. What is the critical information? It should be located together in the pack and should appear in the same view of field where practicable. This item should not be broken up by additional information. You can write everything else everywhere by logos, background texts, or graphics. The information hierarchy should be important. 
the critical information that I, which I mentioned before should should you know give precedence over every other information, and it should be prominence is influenced by text size and style, but it also by other factors such as the color used, the space of the pack, and any graphic elements included in the pack. But I must repeat, the critical information is the critical bit and should be there in all medicines. Next bit, next slide, please. Yeah, so it's a call to action principle because it's a huge topic. So I could I could cover just bits. So what is pack design? The innovative pack design and the incorporating the judicious use of color should be encouraged to en ensure accurate identification and not marketing. So first is that the packaging should be right, the uh, the labeling should be right. And this is to ensure safety. The primary aim is to aid in the identification selection of the medicine. We get confused by all kinds of marketing information with all due respect to marketing, but the goal of packaging and labeling is safety. Only positive statements to be used. And you should take a user test. I don't know whether it's done in India, but it's done extensively in the United Kingdom to ensure the maximum clarity of critical information, whether people are able to read it or not. The color of the text, the font size should be very carefully selected as legibility of the text of the foil is already impaired because of the foil. So you should be very careful. And where similarities exist between product names, pack design should allow differences to be easily discernible. Next slide, please. Yeah, the, the important is, is that people using OTC medicines understand the condition it treat. The information should be given in a language that people will understand and act upon. Medical terminology, please do not use medical terminology because people don't understand medical terminology, except if you by user testing, if you find out somebody is using medical, learn, understand medical technology, okay. Where a product relieves symptoms, the language should only imply that it will relieve symptom and not cure the product. So it is very important for us to be to give the accurate information, relieves and soothes improvement in systems. See, can, to, may help, could, for. Avoid uh, writing this because this sometimes what happens is these products implying that it actually is you know curing things most of the time. Fast acting. Now this should be used where we have the SMPC. It should be scientifically backed. Get to work in so many minutes. You should have a scientific backing for putting this. Just don't put things for the sake of putting. Next slide, please. Yeah. Then like things like 24 hour action, you should always be, you should everything to 24 action, scientific evidence, double or triple action. It can only be used when there are two components which have different sets of action. Do not put double or triple action when you have two APIs with a similar action. Pregnant women should be advised not to take the medicine without professional advice. One thing we should know is no medicine is absolutely safe. And to the consumer, safe means there are no side effects or interaction. Even when there are no known side effects, packaging information should never imply that the medicine is completely safe. There will be some side effects somewhere and we must be pre uh, prepared to use it. Non-drowsy, people should identify, avoid products which may affect driving, very important. Driver drives because of medicine, nobody knows what has happened. There is something wrong in the, in the packaging. So this new, this statement when we may be used where appropriate for a period of one year from the launch of the product, beyond one year, don't say new thing coming, I've changed a little bit, no. Nothing of that, sir. So it should not misdirect people. Acts naturally, works naturally, naturally leaves and leaves symptoms naturally. Such statements that affect as only for products which have a natural mode of action. Action makes a physiological mechanism of the body and not, you know, just putting for the sake of, you know, nowadays we have a lot of organic products so I'm putting naturally. Never do that. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah. And the final thing they'll come to is QR codes or electronic patient information, which we are all moving to. There's a big thing about QR codes. In fact, Racket is actually starting a pilot in India. This is necessitated because of the global shortage of cardboard and paper. So with electronic patient information, what happens is we are able to give 
the real time latest information on the pack which is regulatory control we can give we, because whenever there is a change in the regulation change in the, it takes time before it comes in the pack this one we shall be able to come very quickly this will promote self care very important during the pandemic because you don't have your doctors around so self care is very very important so that is because especially more so in in your consumer products there is no medical interface and we're going to come in with a instructional video on the pack okay so the advantage of qr codes we can put this video so patient goes on the use the qr code and and we can present a video with which they will know about the safety of the product the information which would be deemed acceptable would be likely to include patient support material such as additional disease information and lifestyle information another thing with electronic patient information does it prevents any counterfeit so you can only have an electronic code because there's a big problem of counterfeit medications globally is not just in india please okay so that is the reason that we want to move to electronic patient information leaflet which is slightly difficult because a lot of people are not yet aware especially in the villages of india people are not actually aware and that's why we're taking the help of kamaldeep and dr ratna an international patient organization in actually trying to promote the qr codes so we are going to soon launch this pilot in india called project delhi it will be not launched in tamil nadu i think we are starting with one product called gaviscon thank you very much i think i have really rushed to this presentation and i'm at four minutes i still have <laughs> thank you thank you very much uh, dr bhattacharya i think that was very succinctly put i think one of the issues that you clearly raised there was that um, how information gets across to the patient and in Just what add one thing at the end please remember labeling packaging is only successful when the patient understands and is able to take the right one you can use any razmataz if the patient is not able to understand then your job is not done thank you very much thank you. i think you put it quite succinctly it's, it's a patient that um, matters to everybody and i think one of the issues i think we will cover as we go along and later when we ask questions is about uh, language and use and the uh, foxonomy which is doctors describe things symptoms in one way uh, your common folk describe it in other ways and some things are lost in translations and uh, as i say um the english left but they left us english um is always a problem whereby the medical world lives in english um rest of our countries live in their local colloquial languages could i ask uh, for the next speaker to um uh, to stop up and yeah. share with our viewpoints yeah. um, good evening everybody now we are to talk about the product quality and safety because uh, the pharmaceutical products are highly regularized regulated by various regulatory agencies across the world and there is also globally it is regulated there are uh, good manufacturing practices good clinical practices and so many things because the medicines what we are using it should not cause harm to the patient the manufacturer is more interested in uh, manufacturing and uh, pushing it in the market naturally he is not uh, very much keen on safety issues sometimes unethical practices have also been observed across the world uh, regarding the uh, product safety so let me have the first slide please so what is product quality a product quality refers to how well a product satisfies the customer's needs so customer also is a very uh, vague term here customer is not the patient customer is sometimes a doctor who gives the drugs and evaluates the quality of the product and 
ultimately the patient expresses his satisfaction over the relief of the his condition by using the drugs and so its purpose and meets industrial standards so when evaluating a product quality business considerations several key factors including whether a product solves a problem works efficiently or suits the paid customers uh, purposes can i have an explanation please the quality of the product the pro the product safety product safety is the ability of a product to be safe to intended use as determined when evaluated taken as a set of established rules see safety is there is a, there is a catch you cannot uh, uh, get the safety information immediately so even in the conventional clinical trials we use about 1000 patients and try to say that the we get an approval from a regulatory agency that it is safe but safety issues are very very important and there should be a continuous monitoring of the safety when the product is in the market so we are going to we have evolved a, a global program called as pharmaco vigilance under the leadership of who uh, the pharmaco vigilance global program is located in uppsala there the and it is well organized uh, government uh, sponsored regulatory sponsored agent and now these safety uh, monitoring is a mandatory for a manufacturer please understand is a mandatory for a manufacturer to submit the data every 6 months especially new product is there so 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 now the lot of uh, pharmaco vigilance uh, activities are going across the globe especially even in my country also so next slide please so all medicines carry potential risks as well as benefits we all know about it throughout the uh, life cycle from production to delivery so the risks are the clinical outcomes sometimes if the dose is uh, not properly given and if the drug is missed out and um, if the excess dose is taken so then there is a, a safety issue it's a very very complex uh, so many things can cause a safety issue in a patient but however the quality when we manufacture it should be quality which is uh, as per the standards of the uh, pharmacopoeial standards especially the uh, if the product is uh, labeled as uh, indian pharmacopoeia the indian pharmacopoeia is a a book of standards for the particular medicine and they have got the uh, various uh, um, uh, the monographs and the monographs everything is given very clearly and product should match that that is the product quality and to achieve this there are a lot of uh, inputs you should be given and there should be a monitoring and uh, this monitoring goes on by the regulators Uh, also earlier we, the it was given to the industry himself now now the because of the safety issues the government uh, the regulators especially us fda and uh, uh, drug control department all these play, the things are taking keen interest and if they have found any variation in the quality they are going to question and they have to oh, there have been strictly uh, rules have been implemented so they are always uh, uh, keen on uh, a uh, practice of uh, gmp and uh, the who standards in the manufacture of the drugs next next slide so quality of endangered say so why quality will go off by violating the protocols established by the uh, manufacturers of the quality of medicine by corrupt and inefficiency to implement the established uh, standards practice like good manufacturing practices and good clinical practices poor quality of medicines affect the patient safety directly quality of medicines is dependent on well, not only on manufacturing but also on supply chain management clinical practices and dispensing so many things are involved it's a very complex situation so however for the manufacturing they have to uh, follow this gmp and gcp and it will at least when the product is going to the from the manufacturing side to the uh, uh, patient uh, or this uh, pharmacy where the is going to be handed over to the uh, the uh, the practitioners or the patient it should be maintained properly next can i have the next slide please the knowledge about so, sorry you run 
the, the product quality is ensured by practice of so it's already i think yeah the product quality is ensured by practice of quality control and assurances as i mentioned in the previous uh, uh, product safety is ensured by a program called as pharmacovigilance product quality is endangered due to unethical practices safety issues come to knowledge when a drug accident gets reported in pharmacovigilance program so next slide please the stakeholders of medicine primary uh, patients healthcare professionals public and private organizations pharmaceutical manufacturers distributors wholesalers retailers national regulatory agencies and enforcement agencies training and sensitization of the above stakeholders is a continuous process and there is no there should be never there never be given a gaps in these uh, activities or processes next slide please so regulatory harmonization because now uh, due to the uh, transformation of the world into a global uh, internet is covered by global internet it's called as the whole world is a global village and uh, what happens in india is going to affect the uh, uh, in other the health of the other countries because in india is considered as the one of the a, a global leader for the manufacture of formulations and the development and these formulations are exported and are accepted by the global uh, regulatory agencies uh, that's why the globally uh, harmonization becomes an essential communication between the all the regulatory agencies and the manufacturing uh, uh, authorities all these things have to be continuously in the cross talk between them to enable to achieve the global harmonization regulatory harmonization enables both regulatory authorities and manufacturers to achieve their commitment to the patients next slide please safety of medicines is uh, approached by a practice of pharmacovigilance who has taken a lead by establishing global uh, pv centers in across the world in uppsala switzerland there are national pv programs under the regulatory authorities every manufacturers to run the pv program of for medicines they market and report to the national center periodically and submit the data to the pv center so it has become a very a big responsibility because the safety is very very important if drugs are used for cure of diseases but in case instead of curing a disease if it introduces new symptoms new uh, morbidities it should be taken uh, out of the market this is what the uh, thinking of the world health experts goes on next slide please so i am going to give to these two examples so we usually uh, in the lawsuit uh, information so the us fda is aware of a potential safety issue related to rosiglitazone a drug approved initially for diet of for treatment of type 2 diabetes so diabetes is a worldwide global pan, uh, epidemic now safety data from controlled clinical trials have indicated the risk of heart attacks in patients taking avindia avindia is a brand name avindia uh, avindia was manufactured by groups and then immediately they have to withdraw the product from the market because the the regulators said that no we can't put the patient into the they think although the drug may be effective as it is causing a danger to the patients and we must not uh, uh, allow this product to be marketed in the world so next slide please so the we usually take the diagnostics as they take uh, granted and we we don't uh, care for the this thing so the uh, diagnostics are sometimes given internally uh, for example mri and mri contrast dye is given and uh, is uh, push the slide slide push next button on the slide because the detect ha huh. in the december 2000 sfda received reports of 90 patients with moderate end stage kidney disease who developed the nf nsf and nfd nephro symptomatic the same after after having mri or mri scan with a gadolinium based contrast agent so visually uh, the safety uh, of the diagnostic agents are also very important 
we can't take it at a diagnostic agent it may not harm not like that so the things are very very serious as for the whenever we are going to put the drug or a diagnostic agent in the patient we must be very much cautious it may harm the patient any in any manner so that was also uh, realized and uh, the information about the safety is still scarce we are not getting the, all the safety information uh, in the beginning and in the beginning we are very much excited to introduce a product so that there is going to be a, a solve the diabetes it's going to solve the diagnostic problem but gradually uh, while using it we learn that there are serious uh, uh, safety issues are there then we must uh, withdraw because the drugs are going to alter the dna also person so it can it can have a effect on this thalidomide tragedy we all know about it uh, so we must be very careful so pharmacovigilance is a must which uh, connects to the uh, drug safety next slide please so i will be talking about the uh, indian uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, india emerged as a, a leader as a global leader and also called as the global pharmacy due to supply of uh, formulations throughout the world india has adopted high quality standards and is making generics for north america europe and asia specific so this point you must understand the generics are are very very important because uh, if you leave the product by, uh, to be sold by brand name it will be expensive and uh, the manufacturer will never uh, wants to bring down the prices of the medicine so there is a in the patent act there is a, a patent period is there within that patent period they have taken put any price tag after that expires one has to make the generic and in, in the generics manufacturing the india has emerged as a champion so many many drugs uh, which are going to be expired by the patent they will be uh, the project will start 3 4 years before so when it immediately goes they will uh approach the regulator for the generics with the data and uh, they have to prove that it is the product is equally uh, uh, same as the uh, the branded uh, product available in the market by uh, by the uh, lead manufacturer or the who patent holder so they have to prove that the, it is bioavailability and bioequivalence are almost uh, same and second uh, then the after verifying the data the uh, regulators will give an approval so then the blood drug prices will come down drastically next slide please so in indian pharmaceutical industry the world third largest by volume and 14th largest in terms of value so total annual turnover of pharmaceuticals was in uh, uh, 2019 and 20 were around uh, 33 lakhs crore for the year of 2019 and 20 india manufactures complete range of pharmaceutical products from simple medicines like aspirin uh, uh, paracetamol to the sophisticated biotherapeutics so this is how the india has emerged as a global leader and uh, any questions are there i would like to take up uh, on this thank you very much so the future trends sorry <laughs> okay it's all right last slide please if you can put last slide i would like to conclude the talk so we, according to the indian economic survey 2021 the domestic market is expected to grow three times in the next decade india's domestic pharmaceutical market is at us uh 42 billion dollars in 2021 and is like to be 65 billion dollars by 2024 they and further expand to reach around 120 to 130 billion uh, dollar us dollars by 2030 so this is the, the projected image as per the uh, observing the previous uh, growth rates of concern thank you very much Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nagarpa. I think that that's really set us uh, the scene that we saw how 
patient safety, uh, medication safety is compromised by from labeling and now it's for the manufacturing. Uh, now let's look at uh, uh, that what happens at the point um, uh, where it goes, you know, after it's left the manufacturers. Uh, could I have the next speaker to please address us on this? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Manoj, uh, you are the next. Yes. Can I have the presentation uh, up? Hi. Uh, uh, this is Manoj Likrajani here. Uh, my first exposure to medicine started when I saw my grandmother injecting insulin. And that was way back in the 60s. And when I used to go and purchase that from a chemist store, the blue box of Boots insulin was just given over the counter. After finishing my pharmacy, the first thing that came to my mind is that was the drug that my grandmother administered potent enough to cure her or protect her during the day. With that thing in mind, we set off by saying that we're going to ensure that the product is stored properly, it is transported properly, and the patient is educated properly to understand products should be stored and administered. So when we started up our uh, logistics division, what we did is that we ensured that the product, once it comes from the manufacturer, is kept into validated containers, validated refrigerators, validated uh, cold rooms, validated shipper packs for transport to hospitals and chemists. And what we ensured that the the packs were not only just validated for a particular uh, region, but also a particular season and the duration of the transport. The second phase, what we did is that we would go out and educate the purchaser, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a chemist or a doctor or a patient as to how the product needs to be stored. The concept of storage of cold storage or cool storage isn't really uh, fully aware by the patient or the or even by the trade. The concept is that thanda hona chahiye. Thanda means cold. Cold means if it is kept, if it is, if you feel it, it's good enough. We educated the uh, hospitals and all, saying that for critical care medicines, one has to put it, put it in a validated refrigerator with an online blogger system. But there are a few hospitals today doing this, but we are seeing this trend grow over a period of time. Coming back to the patient part of it, when we look at the patient, what does the patient really do? The patient is being advised by a, by a doctor, he's given a prescription, and he goes to the chemist and picks it up. What we said is that this our role is to be the link between the doctor and the patient. So we need to look at the prescription very carefully and understand what is to be done. For example, if a, a particular drug is written, then the drug dosage that is given is proper. Then the duration of that drug administered should be communicated to the patient. In our country, what happens is that for, uh, let's say, common diseases like blood pressure, a doctor writes a product and gives it to the patient. The patient keeps on taking it endlessly. Now, it's important for the doctor, for the patient themselves, to see that there's a regular follow-up. And no doctor would write it, take it for three months or six months. So as per our internal protocol, what we do is that if the prescription is over six months old, then we send that patient back to the doctor saying that, okay, this is a chronic disease, but he's written for a follow-up, whether it's three months, six months, whatever is, is written on the prescription, we send the prescription, the patient back to the doctor so that the doctor can evaluate what is to be done with the patient. Is he progressing? Is he or she progressing? Is he or she needing a change in the drug? Get that clinical feedback from the patient and then proceed. What is also important is that as pharmacists, we are aware to what kind of ADEs are there, adverse drug reactions are there, 
and what kind of dosage is to be given to a particular patient. Now, I very clearly remember that a new cardiac drug was launched in two strengths. One particular strength for was for people below 60, and there was another strength, a lower dose for people above 60. A leading cardiologist had written a prescription for, for higher dose for a patient who was 70 years. Now, the pharmacist, my colleague pharmacist, looked at the prescription and uh, he said, Sir, this is the prescription and this doctor has written this higher dose. What should I do? I said, what is your protocol? And he said, the protocol, sir, is that he should get a lower dose, but he, this, this doctor is one of the top 10 cardiologists of the country and he has written it. So I said, what do you got to do? He said, there are two things we got to do. One is that we get in touch with the medical department who can talk to the particular doctor or we can pick up the phone and speak to the doctor directly. So I said, go ahead, do it. So I, they, the gentleman, the pharmacist picked up the phone, spoke to the doctor and said, sir, this is what has been done. Can you advise me what I should do? That doctor immediately acknowledged. He said, thank you very much. Please go ahead and change the prescription and give the patient the lower dose. He said, what happens today is that the, the trade per se is not taking enough interest. If people like you guys come in and support us, our role becomes far easier in managing the patient. So I think the first lesson that, that I put across to the entire team was that if you are doing your job, you need to go ahead and do it without fear and educate and communicate to whoever the person is. It let it be a leading doctor because they are willing and the job also is to ensure that the patient ultimately is cured. I'll give a different example. What our objective was when we, when we started this company is to ensure that the community pharmacist reaches the patient's doorstep. So in the critical medicines that we, we manage today, our pharmacist goes to the patient, defies the prescription, ask the patient how to store, how to administer the drug. I'll give another example is that there was a product which was a temperature sensitive product. And my uh, person went to the patient's house to make the supply. And he said, who's the patient? He said, the patient is not there, the servant opened the So they said, who is, is the caregiver there? So the caregiver said, no, he's not there. Please leave the uh, drug and go. My person said, sorry, I'm not going to leave the drug and go. Let me know, I'll come back again. Now, that person was a very big industrialist. And they, that person called up to the office and gave all of us a fire. And they, the call came right up to me. I said, sir, give us a chance. Let us come and meet you. So we went to that person, spoke to that person and told him, sir, if we would have given the product to your servant, she would have kept it out. What would have happened? Would you get an effective dose? Would that medication for which you have spent such a lot of money be effective for you? After looking at us, that person was shocked. And at the second moment, calmed down and said, thank you. So the lesson that we all learned is that if we are aware of, of our responsibilities and the knowledge, that knowledge needs to be shared. And in sharing that knowledge, we can make a difference. So that's the little bit that I wanted to share with you guys. Well, thank you very much. I thank think you that, much. Is, um, that is very good. Um, I think, um, uh, Mr. Manoj, I think it's really put that, that um, the questioning, uh, the act of questioning, and that uh, is the central to the uh, Global Patient Safety Action Plan and the World Patient Safety Day, that uh, to her is human, but to actually investigate that is absolutely divine and that we should, and that there shouldn't be any blame attached, and especially with questions. I think this is something that patients have always said. 
you know, there's a saying that you measure twice and cut once, which practically means that whenever a prescription is made, make sure it checks twice, once at the doctor's side and then once at the pharmacist, because then you take it, that you cut, because if you've cut it, then there's no way to go back into that. And that's very good. I think the other aspect that you've really highlighted, I think, which is central to practice is that the cultural change uh, that in patient safety, the collaboration is there. F from we heard from the manufacturer taking an interest in safety first, then the prescriber, then the pharmacist. And from our point, I think one of um, the things we discussed uh, in Geneva at the World Health Assembly and previously was that if you wanted to put your money to improve patient safety, who would you invest in? And I think 70% uh, of those present said it should be at the pharmacies because we think uh, we think they will be more responsible to check and that the, in a way that they have more time, they've got more essence and they're part of the community. And therefore they, uh, and that's like the last stop because after it leaves the pharmacies, you have very little control. At the pharmacy, yes, you have still control. So thank you very much for this. I think we've got very good. Now, I will now uh, look at um, uh, Mr. Mehta to come in onto this. And I think uh, Mr. Mehta has got um, the same sentiments we have been sharing all day, I think. And uh, he's absolutely passionate about uh, this as well. Mr. Mehta, um, your presentation, because we now need to look at what's happening at that end. You know, it's really now, you're very much closer now, you two, to the. Um, Patient and you know it's something that uh, uh, looking at um, the final steps. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, Ankit, if you could go to the first slide rather than the last, it will be helpful. Cool. Uh, let's jump straight into it. I think what I'm really going to care, uh, cover a little bit is the challenges of what we face today from a hospital point of view as well as a community ecosystem uh, partner. Uh, and second, I'm going to a little bit talk about uh, how we see healthcare in 2050 and how it's relatable to the subject matter context. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, a little bit what I talked about, which is what are the challenges, what are the trends, and what does the future look like? But I think two of the key components that I want to cover here, and feel free to uh, pepper the chat or Q&A with uh, uh, questions. Clearly, I think we all see that complexity in our system is growing and it's uh, unfortunately not growing in a linear fashion. It seems to be almost geometric in uh, nature at the moment where the uh, areas of setting, which means around point of care, around the partners and participants of the healthcare ecosystem are changing as well as areas in the supply chain. Uh, and I think this is quite an important thing. We've had a live fresh study when uh, the vaccines rolled out for COVID in terms of supply chain ownership of uh, uh, pharmaceutical products and specifically vaccines, which you can use as a proxy for some of the challenges we'll face in the future. Uh, and also clearly, I think the caregiver role context is going to change in terms of not just from the participant of highly credentialed clinicians to perhaps uh, folks that need high levels of education, but also machines in the future. So I think that's the context. Quickly to the next one, please. So this is the background uh, around which we've been. We've been in healthcare, as I said, just short of 90 years. Uh, our hospital system, the, the two key notables are that we're in the top 1% in clinical outcomes in India, and this is benchmarked through external agencies. We don't depend on our own publicity vehicles, that's not got any value to us so that tomorrow is better than yesterday. But how are you strong? How do you stack up? And where can you learn the best practices so that you can get better? Because at the end of the day, a person comes to a hospital so that their tomorrow is better than their yesterday, whether it's around celebration for uh, the next generation in obstetrics, or whether it's uh, celebrate coming out of a long-term chronic disease, or more importantly, an acute attack where you're just trying to save your life and uh, hopefully walk out of the hospital rather than uh, uh, something much worse. So I think that's the way we look at healthcare, that how do we make sure that uh, we're strong? We've had a number of spin-offs. We were the institute that brought home healthcare to India. We spun out India Home Health in 
We're talking about 2009, which was the first home healthcare organized provider in India. And we sold that to the world's number three, Bayada, uh, about six years ago. So uh, we've had a fair degree of track record in health, in pharma, and a few other things. Uh, but what we've learned more importantly is how do you work well with your peers, your neighbors, and more importantly, folks outside your ecosystem, whether it's academic institutions like IIT Madras or the Robert Bosch Center of Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, or uh, ecosystem consortium partners like Kaho, AHPI, or more importantly, and more recently, startups like IBAR, who do some great work in patient safety uh, and quality auditing. Next, please. So I'm gonna spend a bit more time on what are the challenges of today and uh, bear with me because each of these is actually a slide, but in the paucity of time, I'm gonna focus on what are the key takeaways for you, which are clearly we're going through a time where the ecosystem is almost grappling with whether it plays more to generics or whether it's branded. And clearly it's not a simple answer. A lot of doctors are supplied medicine are, uh, given top-ups in terms of uh, provision of medicine to their uh, unable to pay patients by branded pharmaceutical companies when they prescribe their drugs for, to the uh, uh, wealthier in health systems and therefore they have enough medication and enough capacity to uh, do patient education in other ecosystems. So this is an area where I think if we can figure out the right uh, horse in the right place. So what I really mean by this is at a systems level, there are clearly a lot of drugs that need to be generic so that the cost of healthcare for a system, whether it's India, the National Health Service, uh, or the uh, American uh, various healthcare provider schemes that need to be systems level solutions, right? And there clearly then need to be a lot of branded drugs, especially around cutting edge, because if you don't have that you're not going to get innovation at the pace we're currently uh, appreciating it as much. So whether it's the rackets of this world or uh, fantastic companies that have created awesome molecules that help save lives, I think we have to figure out who we work with so that we get the right place. And sometimes we have to go to generics because we have no choice because of cost. But most of the time, if we can have a balancing act between these around a systems level solution, so whether chronic disease needs to play a bit more to generics, whether there are certain uh, key medications in every country that perhaps have country support rather than uh, company support, I think it will be critical. Second is integration with the supply chain. And here, what I really want to emphasize is increased transparency. So for those of you who lived through COVID, you now have seen that there are a number of vaccinations across India. And I'll just give you a simple example in Tamil Nadu, a state which is representative of Germany uh, in terms of population and perhaps a bit bigger than Germany in time, I mean, sorry, in, uh, a little bit smaller than Germany in terms of GDP. Uh, you've got the reality where you have had to dispose of some 50,000 to 100,000 vaccines because they expired. And really the fundamental question is what the hell you had COVID vaccines, which were in short supply in other parts of the world. And we've had to dispose of these because we were not able to either extend the date uh, appropriately with the blessing of the pharmaco or uh, with the blessing of the government. And this is a real issue. Who owns the components of the supply chain? We all know that there are two pharma companies that supplied about 99.9% .9 of all vaccines in India. Uh, I think both of them are well known. Both of them have had record profits this year. And yet they have not been in some circumstances happy to take back and take ownership of the supply chain. And so therefore the hospital or a small clinic ends up with lumped up problem of a lot of uh, vaccines that have no end use. I mean, a lot of hospitals donated their vaccines to the government, and I think fantastic work by the Association of Healthcare Providers of India. But the reality is that's a small fraction. Maybe we had about 200,000 doses uh, saved, but why couldn't we have saved 250,000 uh, plus and given it to other countries that perhaps were desperate for some of these vaccines? And we know the efficacy of these because they're proven. So ownership and proper integration of the supply chain is going to be very critical. The next thing is we've been having a long-term grapple with 
the hospital pharmacy versus local pharmacy versus a central supply with the government. I think most people on this call, whether you join from uh, the NHS system or other parts of the world, Medicare, Medicaid, or uh, places in the Netherlands or most European communities, or even Singapore, you know that there are central pockets of supply that are linked to payers. You also have clearly a local pharmacy ecosystem where you leave a hospital, you'll find 50 pharmacies that want to take your medication and try and supply some things, perhaps at a lower cost. Sometimes they're not able to supply at a lower cost, but they're right next to the person's house, so it's more convenient. But what we are also beginning to see a real risk of is you're seeing a lot of payer arbitrage coming in. So where insurance companies and special payer plans are coming in that are beginning to prescribe certain types of drugs and certain nature of uh, the specific drugs to be given, as well as vaccines. And this is not something we'd seen before. We're seeing structured plan programs coming into place, especially for chronic disease uh, areas for cancer drugs. Uh, and we're clearly beginning to see the raise of the online aggregators. And keep in mind that th this comes at cost, right? It's not just in areas like spurious drugs. So spurious drugs, everybody knows about that. I think in big urbanized pockets of India, a lot of that has diminished dramatically, but there's still pockets in rural India and even in urban, which it still exists, which hopefully in the next decade or so, we'll start seeing that go to zero. But we're starting to see the rise of drug without prescriptions right uh, and i say this drug sin uh, because sin being without but it's also a sin because it is to the medical community it has a cost because then you've got pharma uh, clinical pharmacists in hospitals or health systems or even drug plans that are now having to work with almost one eye blind or a hand tied behind a person's back and the other challenge that we're getting to see is near expiry drugs is there a way of getting rid of them early for all the participants of the pharmaco system so that the cost to the customer at the end of the day that's what we're focusing on how do you make a cost to the customer the end consumer less next year versus last year and no i'm not talking about how to increase profits by a pharmaceutical company that's not the intent i think the intent is how we as an ecosystem try and do something about medical inflation uh i mean uh, so the, uh, the second thing I want to highlight is the fact that we're going to clearly see the rise of machine learning and AI across the health system. Uh, and where I see this being priceless today is in hospital medical drug drug interactions and checkups, uh, whether you're giving the right uh, drugs, whether they're based on allergies and patient histories, uh, we're able to see that a doctor by accident has not uh, prescribe the wrong medication because they're distracted by seeing so many patients uh, in an hour of their inpatient rounds or more uh, importantly in outpatients when you're seeing uh, 30 patients per hour in an outpatient ecosystem how do you make sure you reduce that are there simple tools that are very low cost and i emphasize low cost you can't add a new intermediary in a healthcare system and expect somebody to carry the bill neither can the government in india afford it it can't and neither can the person who at the end state, uh, whether it's a middle income family or a low income family be able to afford it. The wealthy may be able to afford it, but has no desire to pay for it, right? So I think how do you do that is becoming very, very critical. And keep in mind, we've been in the healthcare system for uh, around uh, 90 years. So this is not based on one wishy-washy uh, profit maximizing healthcare systems point of view. This is based a lot on depth of what we've seen and what works. When my grandparents started our hospital system, we used to struggle to get ink and paper, right? Because that was British area reality. And they, the British did a lot of good things for India. But some of the things in the early days that were not so simple to get hold of was how did you get ink if the British only supported certain hospitals that were their own? And how did you serve the rest of customers? So think about what a patient record would have looked like in 1933 if you didn't have ink and you didn't have paper, right? And you didn't have ballpoint pens. In those days, you had these ink pots and you had dip dip fountain pens with the nib. I mean, not even with a storage tank. So I think it's like we're thinking about EV vehicles today. We're seeing a very different reality in terms of storage so that you don't have to use electricity live uh, so that we can appreciate the best of the uh, opportunities today. And what we're clearly seeing is digital, legal, and privacy 
concerns and costs in healthcare are growing. And I'll come back to this last point because I think this has a deep implication for us in medication. I think digital will help us. I think legal will clearly not help us in the short term. And I think privacy will hurt us in the long term because the more we worry about our privacy, the less we will worry about uh, having regulators and transparency in healthcare ecosystems because there will always be challenges in terms of uh, how we share data. Uh, we're clearly moving towards home and convenience-based healthcare. So this means supply din dynamics will change. If I rewind the clock 15 years ago, we never had to worry about what happened at home. We never had to worry about prescriptions that a doctor gave, how it would be interpreted uh, at home. We're beginning to see that ecosystem change quite dramatically. And we expect we will see much more of that in time. And that means the uh, basis of drug compliance will evolve dramatically. Uh, and today we're only fighting allopathic to allopathic to a large extent with a little bit of Ayurveda and naturopathy and other uh, forms of traditional medicine. But someday we will be fighting with different forms of all types of medicine, right? Not just grandma's uh, best cocktail, which in the olden days was great, but perhaps not the case all the time. And clearly we're seeing challenges around funding sources, technology and payer aggregators that will tell us what drugs and medication to use. Uh, so I think these are some of the uh, uh, opportunities that are there uh, uh, for people. Uh, just a second, sorry guys. Uh, and last, we're going to see areas like in terms of challenges today, I've already talked about the uh, expired drugs and vaccines, who really has ownership. If you ask us, Hospitals and small clinics and the government really can't afford this ownership. This needs to be a better systems managed approach, at least in India and perhaps across the world. Next, please. So what are the trends we see if I look at this from a snapshot of 2050? So uh, fast forward 25 plus years, what is the future look like? We're going to have interconnected everything. Today, if you have an Apple iCloud account, you can have the same Apple experience in an office. Uh, on your iPhone, on the move, or at home on your uh, laptop. You'll see this, but in fundamentally different ways. Uh, unfortunately, for those who like their privacy, I'm sorry, your spouses and kids will know exactly what your healthcare reality is. You will have to credential them, but once they get credentialed, they're not, want, they're not going to want to give up the rights. Because uh, families at the end of the day were a great guardian for each other and an integrated model. We will see a lot more personalized medicine and personalized healthcare assistance. In fact, we might get fed up of the number of uh, apps on our phone that want to personalize our healthcare. Uh, somewhere in the next 10 years, I would argue, we will get an overabundance of digital assistance, whether it's an Apple watch to a Fitbit watch, you'll have everybody trying to be your dada and mama in terms of what you should do and what you should not do. So I'm sure just like you get irritated with emails and uh, settings on your phone, you will probably get a lot more irritated in time, at least in the short term before the long term. The next is we're clearly going to see more design to order on the fly uh, developed and produced drugs. And I do, what I mean by this is the efficacy of a drug is fundamentally different depending on the uh, clinical pathway in which you consume the drug, whether it's liquid, whether it's gas, whether it's some other form of intravenous, uh, and we will find even more bio-customized uh, models. And so therefore, towards that, we will see a lot more design to order drugs on the fly and based on customer data. Uh, where this will lead, and in real time, keep in mind, this will be real time in the future. You will have bioengineered human parts, which are drug eluting. So you will have to not only worry about what you give a person consumed by mouth, you will have to worry about what's already in their body to be protected. And today you have that with very few parts or systems parts, but tomorrow you will have that at a much more macro headache level is what I'd argue. Because some of your customers will actually forget to tell you that they've had bioengineered or biohacked cyber parts. And how do you manage that? Today, you have people in a hospital that forget to tell you they're taking some homeopathy drug at the same time as they're taking allopathic drugs. And so therefore, when the efficacy of the drug or the treatment care pathway doesn't go to plan, the onus and the headaches come to you as a hospital or healthcare provider. How are you going to manage at this at different scale? Uh, 
Then you've got areas like uh, the credential supply chains. Nearly everything will be tracked and accountable in real time. But more importantly, I have an expectation that we will actually have custom private supply chains and custom supply chains that are government regulated. And if you think about this, if you were a pharma system that had to manage multiple supply chains, in the short term, this will give you a lot of data. It will help you become uh, better at managing your system. But in the long term, this will give you headaches at scale because it means that there will be controllers to your supply chain depending on how much they supply. And we saw examples of that when people were getting remdesivir and many of the other medications in short supply during COVID where specialized supply chains were created to get these hard to uh, uh, procure medication, including in very large systems where it should have been uh, open to all, or it should not have differentiated because of wealth or status, but you had that. Uh, society clearly will have standards for everything. Uh, humans will be in different point of care realities, whether it's on the moon or Mars or God help us in the meta space, how they expect me to worry about uh, their meta equivalent of customers. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm sure that for patient safety and education, the meta ecosystem will probably be quite critical to our uh, long term survival. If you can simulate uh, how a patient might react or their family might react to certain medication, uh, prescription uh, and the like using meta uh, scenarios, the sense I have is that we will make life much safer. Uh, then clearly quality, legal and compliance will be more machine policed in real time. So that the challenge you will have to face as a healthcare system is when do you treat a customer and when do you pay attention to self-regulation, right? And self-management, because if you've got this happening in real time, it's almost like you getting your nonstop calls while you're seeing your patient as a clinician uh, in a hospital by the people around you. And I'm not sure how that's going to help you focus on the customer to make sure the customer gets the right drug, get the right uh, dosing at the right place, at the right point uh, and at the right time. How are you going to manage that complexity? Uh, and the agenda of the planet will be more on sustainability and planet. So therefore packaging, disposal, method of consumption will all become very critical parameters that we aren't thinking about today. And the last point I wanna highlight is the top 10 killers and diseases. If you look back 50 years ago, if you look back hundred years ago, only three of the ones in the last 50 years are still there today. That same thing will be there in 50 years time, which is the top 10 killers and diseases will not be the same. And my absolute prayer to all of you, I hope we don't see medication errors on that list because the trust with clinicians is already diminished. How do we make sure that whatever's there does not move further to the Dr. Google reality, which is non-accountable and it's proliferous, but it's not really solving, I think, societal problems in any form. Next, please. So what does the future look like? And here are some examples, whether it's in education, whether it's in care treatment protocol, whether it's in just human contact and what is the future of mankind that we will have to someday send out uh, creatures to space. And at least for me, I prefer the picture on the bottom left to the one on the bottom right, because if that's my wife, then I'd rather prefer to be in bed uh, giving her cuddles than having a robot do it. But the reality is that's what our future will look like where we are competing against the best practices of a machine, which to a large extent is probably much better at managing components of the healthcare than we are today. Next, please. So, so what? We've talked a little bit about many aspects of healthcare and I want to end on this. So uh, for those of you who are looking at the time stopwatch, uh, I do apologize that it's slightly uh, at the tight end of the spectrum. Uh, I think clearly we want to see more frictionless health and medications at fingertips of the uh, critical part of the ecosystem, which is the patient, right? At the end of the day, if the customer is first, that's what we've really got to solve. Uh, I think clearly the top 10 killers and diseases will be different. I actually had that uh, for three slices of time, but uh, unfortunately for the paucity, I removed that. We will clearly as human society live past 100. For those of you who don't have high quality of uh, life, my suggestion is start solving for that because the good news is your uh, uh, 
uh, Dali will improve, but your quality, I think, is in your control. So you better do something about that quick, uh, quickly. Uh, and more importantly, the reality is we will be cyber humans, whether it will be in workshops or in hospitals, I'm not 100% sure. I hope that it's in hospitals rather than tattoo parlors, because then at least we have capacity to control and audit and accredit uh, a lot more systems. I think we will clearly have owned controlled supply chains within systems. And I think this is a big piece for medication. So for those who are listening, who have capacity to influence that, I think let's not over-regulate the wrong piece of the spectrum. The soft stuff will clearly, will clearly be the hard stuff. Today already we're seeing the importance of mental health over physical health sometimes. We will see care being more important than tech in the future. It's already important. I don't think you need a rocket science degree to figure this out. But I think in the short term, human beings will forget that sometimes technology is there to enable us to have a better life rather than to dictate our life. But in the short term, that's never the case. We will clearly have teams of machines and non-machines alongside human beings. And please take note of that. You do not have case to delay that. The reality is it's going to happen. We can control how it happens. We can't control when it will happen because that's not just in your control. It is in the control of too many participants on the ecosystem. And at the end of the day, the right answer will find its way to the top. Our hope is that we are around to enjoy it with them to the best of our capacity. Uh, and for those who fight too much against the rise of machines, machines are going to be there. Now, our hope is that as clinicians, you don't have machines that uh, diminish our importance in the ecosystem. But my sense of reality is they will probably take a lot of the grunt work, the early diagnosis, the preliminary diagnostics out of the system by being the early warning reality. Uh, and then I think hospital systems and healthcare settings will become much more complex because the footprint of cure is going to change. It is not just going to be in a hospital setting. It's not just going to be in a clinic setting. It's clearly going to be with a number of other participants, members of the family. There's a fantastic company that we saw, Health Sensei, that we're actually putting some capital into that actually involves the patient's community ecosystem partners as well as multiple stakeholders across a healthcare system to make emergency medicine, to make vital monitoring and make acute attacks of chronic diseases safer and compliance of drugs safer for uh, not only clinicians, but also the patient as well as the families so that there is more ownership at a systems level rather than at an individual level. Uh, so it's nice to get an app reminder saying you have not taken your medication, but what's it like if you get an app reminder to the person's loved one 25 minutes after they missed their call saying the person's vital has not changed and therefore we suspect they have forgotten to take their medication, right? And an hour later to the doctor so that the doctor can send their closest home health care provider to a person's home. And we've seen that technology live today. So this, there's nothing that stops us from making it reality tomorrow. And I think borders and cities will be meaningless. In fact, I am absolutely certain today we worry about how the uh, American drug system worries about Mexican drugs or the British health system worries about non-prescribed drugs from across Europe because they can be prescribed at a lower cost. The reality is you fast forward 25 plus years, that's not going to be a headache. We may have a problem if you go to Mars because I'm sure there'll be control systems on Mars and the moon. But the reality is you will probably not be able to control it anywhere like we're able to control it today. So let's pick the right system in place. If we can figure out a system where a drug is provided to a person in India with what a person can afford in India to what a person can afford in a developed part of the world, I think that's fair game. And if we can figure out a, a drug at a far cheaper cost to Africa, to the health systems across Africa, therefore the landed cost to a patient with drone delivery is at the same price as the person in India or the person in the developed world, I think we will see a better future for all mankind. Next, please. And I think with that, I'd like to end. So I think that's it. I apologize to the organizers that we've taken a bit longer than- No, no, no. It's a, it's a very, it's a, it was very welcome. I think it, it sets the scene. Um, uh, now I have the most difficult task here. Yes, there's some questions waiting, but also somebody asked to summarize this in, uh, one word, and I think uh, I'm going to use a picture. So I'll just share something with you. Um, 
uh, the context of where this take, is taking place. Uh, Ankit, could I have the privilege to share the screen, yeah? One second, I don't care. So the, the uh, issue here is that what we are talking here today is firstly that um, there is this context of the World Patient Safety Day coming up on 17 September 2022, uh, that the context is that uh, the team is medication without harm and it's the team has got its roots from the WHO's global patient safety challenge medication without harm which was launched in 2017. This is the format of what we are now talking of. Um, one of the issues that uh, we looked at this morning or which of a series is looking at a series of things on this quadrant. Uh, this lecture particularly was in the bottom quadrant here, the quadrant in orange. Uh, we are going uh, uh, clockwise in that uh, we looked at uh, as an issue in that. We then looked at uh, the issue of uh, naming, uh, labeling at that, very important on that. Then we went into the logistics uh, where our speaker spoke about uh, the storage and disposal element. And then what uh, Dr. Mehta has finished us on this quadrant uh, is on the right product at the point of care and sketch a picture of what will come in the future, how things will be uh, building up. Now we know that these this quadrant works effectively if all the elements are while well, working together. And as uh, Dr. Mata was uh, speaking, uh, I just remember that there was a cartoon I had uh, been penning together and it was about overdosing on apps. And it's very uh, the number of apps we have, number of medications that at one time or other we'll have a new disease and public health problem where we have overdosed on apps. So it's very important to take them. Now to uh, summarize, the questions, I think the first question that's come in, I think it's very important for us. A lot of countries are pushing for one health, meaning that uh, human, um, animal, plant, and environmental health go together. How does disposal of drugs uh, take precedent? Is there, is there a way to uh, improve that or is there a way to look at that? Um, I will start firstly with uh, Dr. Meta because I think you're the ones who, as you said, ended up uh, with the many out of expiry date um, uh, vaccines and things. What, what happens there? Uh, is there a way to tackle that? So I, I think uh, it's a fantastic insight that who takes ownership for that. And the reality is today, nobody is, right? Uh, a government acts as a regulator, but the reality is the person who is the best informed to take ownership. And this is uh, the old uh, United Nations Convention on uh, uh, Fertilizers and Chemicals uh, is uh, the old prescripts is, should be the pharmaceutical company, right? From cradle to grave that it should manage. The reality is during vaccines, they did not take ownership. Uh, mm -hmm. And no disrespect today, the implication of that means that uh, for the next generation of vaccines that have just been released for pediatrics into the ecosystem, there aren't many takers because nobody wants to be lumbered up with vast amounts of unutilized vaccines. And so the onus of vaccination is moving back to the government, where perhaps during COVID, we saw amongst the best innovations of uh, clinical care health system was the fact that it was shared quite equally, especially in a place like India. And perhaps we weren't perfect, especially as wave two showed us, uh, but we were definitely better than many other parts of the world. And 
we actually uh, were able to perform, I think, at a quite a high standard relative to what we observed in other parts of the world. We have a long way to go, but I think if we can get the private sector, if we can get the various constituents of healthcare working together, you will get great innovations and strides ahead. But the right owner for something like medication, uh, replacement, uh, how it is expired, how it should be uh, removed from the system is actually the provider. Today, if you look at biomedical waste, uh, the practices, and we are part of the United Nations project, uh, as amongst a few other hospitals in India, uh, we've been one of the role models, is the reality is it, the practices are monopolistic, they're controlled by politicians, they aren't really the safest in the place where you see a lot of these uh, things rolling up in the middle of plastic waste disposal sites or landfill sites. So I think that can be dramatically improved, but I think the right owners should be on the supplier rather than anybody else. So th thank you very much. I think this is what's happening in Europe elsewhere, uh, manufacture of plastics, where the state has said that it's the responsibility of the manufacturer, that uh, you have to work with the supermarkets, that's the end point, and uh, take on through bottle banks or plastic banks, whatever your products. That you, um, so it's very important. Now, the second question, I think uh, I would like to go to Professor Nagapa was in this one. Uh, in the logistics uh, framework uh, of things um, uh, and uh, manufacturing control, the good manufacturing practice um, systems, do you think these should be uh, run by the state or should there be a separate agency? running this. What's your view on this? Because I think where the question is coming from is from the point of view that uh, the state has been responsible for overseeing a lot of regulation, but it fails. But an independent agency, which is in the control of with FDA and others in charge, may be doing a better job. What's your opinion on that? Uh, should that be independent of the state, uh, like a separate agency? Professor Nagba, have we lost him? Okay, um, I will. I will go. I'll pose the same question to um, Mr. Manoj. Mr. Manoj, are you there? We could ask the same question to you. Yes, yes. Now the question is regarding disposable or disposal of medicines. Yeah, the, uh, actually, it's about both. The the, it's the question is about uh, uh, good manufacturing practice. And how should that be managed or regulated? Should the state be managing or, or should there be an independent agency, uh, an agency which maybe the FDA or the European Medicines Agency and the government has got a part in? Uh, reason this question is coming was many fear that if uh, good manufacturing practices uh, assessment is left to the state, uh, things will not be done as they should be. What's your so, opinion, so the process independent agency or state sector? So the FDA is the right agency for which uh, for monitoring uh, good manufacturing practices. And in India, as you may be aware, that the FDA does take up this responsibility and doing a pretty good job of it. So I think that's the way it is. And that's the way it should be. The yes. FDA are two types in, in our country, that is the state as well as the center, and both mm -hmm. support and monitor it. So that, that's the way it should go. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that you're absolutely right. And uh, then uh, there's a general question. Um, uh, how can uh, patient engagement in communications across this uh, work, uh, for instance, in labeling or in uh, end of point, is there room for patients to join you um, at either end of the value chain? I will ask uh, Samir. Is it, would you have a suggestion on that? Would patients be valuable, um, uh, valuable uh, partners in improving that uh, point of sale patient safety? No, I think accountability at the end of the day has to be at a customer, right? A patient has to take more accountability over their health. 
And I think the challenge that most government systems are, it's a balancing act on how to make sure that there is accountability for components that are within the scope of control of a, let's say a hospital provider or a clinician. Uh, and therefore you have the liability uh, that goes to that particular participant. But the reality is, uh, I think as COVID has taught many patients and uh, customers, patients, the wrong term here, many customers, you're, you're accountable for your own health. But I think a lot of people didn't take that as seriously during the peak of COVID. So how do you find the balance in, uh, and are there tools that can be used for a customer to take better health compliance uh, at their end? So uh, in the United States, of course, there used to be these apps that told you that there was drug-drug interaction, right? And that was fair for allopathic drug comparisons. But what do you do about non-allopathic? Uh, mm -hmm. As of today, there are some apps that have started coming up that talk about food-food interaction and how your body absorbs that. But the reality is different people's bodies, biorhythms and their, how their proteins break down uh, molecules is fundamentally different depending on the type of human you are in different parts of the world. So what was developed for, let's say, an anglo uh, Saxon community is very different to what may be to an Indo-Aryan race uh, set of parameters, which is different for different parts of the world. So the sense I have is, can we get the right balance with the right person to take ownership of their life is the customer. And can we then go backwards from that with who are the right liability owners and owners from a control system to enable components of that health that are provided. So in a hospital, clearly it's the hospital owner that you do not by accident give them the wrong medication. By accident, you don't give them the wrong dosage or the wrong timing, or even worse, you make a fundamental mistake and you, uh, in the olden days, they used to operate on the wrong patient. I think there's a, an example during medication safety that I heard there is only one example where you go into a theater uh, and this was in one of the very early surgeries and not only do you kill the person whose leg you're trying to saw off, but the people around them, because by accident, you, when you ask somebody to hold them down, you accidentally cut digits of the thing. And therefore they drug, they died of the medication you gave afterwards. Uh, that happens more and more today because you've got uh, risks of reality. So can you give that ownership to the right participant? I think matters. Now, when you have a supermarket involved, there's a fundamental difference because the supermarket does not have ownership and cannot control ownership for a lot of things. And they don't want that ownership. So they're going to pass that ownership burden to a pharmacist or to somebody else who sits in their ecosystem, a supplier. Like you've seen today, you've got Walmart that only gets uh, uh, supply when it needs supplies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that making sure we don't, we're not over enthusiastic of the point of care to the wrong participants in the ecosystem. Like there are home healthcare companies in India that are completely non-regulated. They're complete quacks. They don't have accredited nurses to give the injections. They don't have doctors who are actually the right person to prescribe the medication and yet they exist. Uh, how do you get rid of them? Uh, I think unless we get that last mile of the healthcare system controlled appropriately or at least regulated in a fair manner, you cannot go backwards and force upon the wrong constituent control mechanisms. Okay, th th thank you very much. I think this is really brilliant. I think um, now it's my honor and duty to thank all the participants. I think you have really livened up the debate and brought great insight. And also to our viewers that have participated in this, um, please uh, keep a lookout um, for further uh, events and programs that are being planned. And we would like to ensure that when we come up to the 17th of September uh, to mark the World Patient Safety Day, we all know what our um, role is, and we all know what the issue is, and then we can have an informed collective voice. I think that's what needs to be heard. And that collective voice is not only meant for our own patient groups and patient organizations to step up to the mark and let's pull our socks up, but also to our um, um, governments, health authorities and payers, whoever is responsible for this. But lastly, more importantly, uh, uh, Samir said was that it's ultimately our responsibility to shape our own ecosystem, uh, that we should make our 
health environment safe. And after that pandemic, I think it's uh, absolutely important that we have to clean our own house before we look outside. So thank you very much for your contributions. And uh, thank you very much for your insight. And thanks for the questions. We couldn't answer all of those, but be prepared to see some of the answers uh, later on we will be sharing with everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, all have a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Kavaldeep. Thank you. Enjoy. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Samir. I think, and uh, we'll keep in touch and uh, hey, keep sharing some of it. There's, there's we have to catch up with some nice Indian food there and some nice Indian food here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, that's the tragedy of life, I think. I, I mean, I, I've got 